No. Tom and Harry had a good relationship and the family had a good relationship together. So I'm delighted that Tom can be here with us. We'll, we'll do this service together this morning. Uh, I'm glad all of you could be here. I think everybody made it that was supposed to. Is Shiloh here? How good she made it? That was the one we were concerned about. Glad you're here. And did everybody else make it that was intending to? Very good. Praise the Lord for that. I'm glad everybody's here.
Strengthen us in this time of our need. Thank you for the words of Scripture, the comfort of your spirit, and the assurance of salvation through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's sing a good hymn of the faith together, not what my hands have done.
I thought these last 17 years of memories were it for me and Grandpa until one day when we would meet again. But God surely works in mysterious ways and he gave me one more surprise. You see, when I like a verse in the Bible or a verse is special to me, I go and highlight it. And as I was going through my Bible to find my grandpa's two favorite psalms, which are Psalm 91 and 42, I saw that in both of these, I had parts of them highlighted. For me, that was one more connection and one more memory between me and grandpa. I would continue to miss my grandpa and love him, but, I, but whenever I'm overwhelmed with sadness, reading these two psalms will be a constant reminder that, of the memories that we shared and that he is in God forever. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When, I can, when can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude leading the procession to the house of God. With shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will let, for I will yet praise you, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love. At night his song is with me, a prayer to God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony, as my foes taught me, saying to me all your day long, Where is your God? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Dad passed away a few days ago, and looking back on his life, a life of 92 years, came to my mind, how do we, how do I view greatness? How do I define success at the end of life? A new car in the driveway? A sizable savings account? A beautiful new home with all the furnishings? A prominent position in the church or the community? elder or deacon at the Peace Church, the ability to capture an audience with eloquent speech, a great farmer. The psalmist said in Psalm 1, Blessed is the man who delights in the Lord, and on his law meditates day and night. And Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, for he directs the path. And as Dad and I visited together from time to time on the phone, we would talk about God's faithfulness in his life on the farm, in the military, in his aneurysm, in his surgeries, and everything in between. One of his favorite songs, as we just sang, in all the stuff of his life, speaks of how he viewed himself in the light of his humanness. And I think sometimes, at least when I sing that song, I sing it, but if you listen to the words, not what my hands have done can save my guilty soul, not what my toiling flesh has borne can make my spirit whole. Not what I say or do can give me peace with God. Not all my prayers and sighs and tears can bear my awful load. And 
in the line, I bless the Christ of God. I rest on his love divine. And with unfaltering lip and heart, I call this Savior mine. He saves me. He gives me pardon. And I love because he loves. And I live this life because he lives. That was Dad's heart, the hope and the promise of the believer. The heart of the gospel and the message of salvation. That is where he put his faith and trust in his faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He was tired. His race was run and the journey was coming to a close. He was ready to move from his earthly home to heaven. God's grace had safely brought him through farming, a family, the nursing home, and all of life. For at the end of life, grace paid for dad's sin. Grace gave him strength to run the race, and grace led him home to heaven, where he now sees Jesus face to face. We're saved by grace. Mom and dad left us a legacy of faith. <coughs> And it is now up to us as their children to carry the torch and burning it brightly, following Jesus as he leads all of us. Today we have many memories, many things to share. And we have moments of sadness as we recall dad and grandpa and great grandpa and great great grandpa. But you know, today we all have a measure of joy. Because many years ago, Jesus was born. He lived, he died, and he rose again for dad, for mom, for Sandy, for Carlin, for Sherry, for Rhonda. And for all of us who claim him as Savior and Lord, and so as we, as we, each of us, move from earth to heaven, may, all, may it be said of all of us that Jesus would open his arms and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you, Sandy, for those uh, precious remarks. Your blonde sister said she would not be able to get through this sad exercise, so I'm filling in for her with my own recollections and selected memories of our dear father, and some thoughts for us, the living. I've often marvel, marveled at the workings of the human mind, especially as it relates to memories and the processing of the passage of time. Time is a curious thing. Some things which seem to have happened just yesterday, at the same time, seem to have happened in a different lifetime, played out by actors posing as us. I often cannot remember what happened last week, but I have some very vivid memories of things that took place when I was as young as two or three. One of my earliest uh, memories comes from a time when my family lived in an old house a block north of the Malacca Armory. On Wednesday nights in the summer, my mom would take my sister, my baby sister Pat, and I to nearby Memorial Park for the weekly band concert in the band channel there. It may be that my lifelong love of music began there, either there or in the living room of that old house near the armory on nights with my dad and three of his buddies, Pete Keel, Hank Keel, and Harry Morlick along with their wives, would gather for rehearsals of the quartet that they had formed. I don't remember who played the piano, probably one of the wives. My mother would sometimes play her guitar. My small childhood mind, for some reason, made note of the fact that as the men gathered around the piano, Harry would always set his knee on the piano bench. Go figure why a small thing like that stuck in my mind. Although I don't think I ever heard Harry and his mother Hattie singing and playing together in their own home parlor, Carlinda has related how much 
her dad used to love singing the old time hymns and songs with her grandma. She relates how once he lost the tip of a finger in a farm machinery accident. After he recovered, he picked up the guitar and was shocked to realize that one of the fingers he needed to play the guitar was too short. Another memory. I have never been much of a fisherman. I think it's owing to the fact that when I was a little boy living right on the Rome River in Malacca, my old neighbor, Ernie Johnson, would sometimes take me fishing down there. The only thing we ever caught were those ugly bullheads with their black <laughs> tentacles. And they scared me to death. I never wanted to touch one of those things. So I have done very little fishing in my life, but I've always liked the idea of fishing. Harry helped me realize the joys of the idea of fishing. That curious physical and mental contest between a fisherman and that invisible, elusive intelligence beneath the water. It seemed to me that it was sort of a battle of wits, and I have always enjoyed a battle of wits. Whenever we would visit Minnesota, after Carlinda and I were married, Harry would often pull his fishing boat out of the garage and we would spend some time at the lake. I would only watch, but just being on the boat, in the boat, uh, floating on the lake ripples was such a joy. I especially remember a particular week at Serpent Lake with the family. And the days trolling around the lake for Northern Pike with those long cane poles, uh, you've seen it here. Uh, we so much distinguished the Dutch fishermen from Pease that any lake that one would visit in the region. Without a doubt, the greatest gift Harry ever gave me came on October 26, 1968, when he gave me his second daughter in marriage. Little did I know at the time what a marvelous treasure he was giving me. I love her then. I love her infinitely more now. Seems like a timeless gift since she never seems to grow old. Many have remarked. How can I ever forget the day five years later when we received a call at our home in Salt Lake City that Carlinda's dad had suffered a serious brain aneurysm? We were told there was a good chance he might not survive. We drove virtually nonstop for 26 hours to get to Minnesota for what we thought might be the last opportunity to see him alive. Well, by God's great mercy and grace, it was not our last opportunity. And although that medical challenge changed his life permanently, we had him with us for another 40 years. Although I've known him all my life, literally 69 and a half years, I regret to say that I only had short periods of time to be with him on our visits here, owing to the fact that we always lived a long distance away. And during his and mother's occasional visits to whatever, wherever we lived at various times. So most of my memories about Harry Morlake involve general impressions of his way of life. Puttering around the house or yard, watching ball games or game shows on TV, going out to eat at this or that restaurant or supper club, going to the lakes, as I mentioned, having fun with the grandkids, discussing the events of the day or the week with relatives and family get-togethers. I loved coming to the farm. When my grandparents retired from farming, I lost one of the most precious elements of my young life. So I'm always happy to return to the Morlake farm to get back in touch with the land and the joys of rural living. Perhaps one of the most cherished memories is that of my father-in-law's spiritual life, which was Sandy detailed um, very beautifully. He was not an educated man, having only completed formal schooling, schooling through the eighth grade. His conversations were not complicated. But when he prayed, when he prayed, some very profound thoughts and eloquent words came to expression. There was always such grand theology in his prayers. But the phrasing was that of a learned man. I often wished I could pray like that. His prayers no doubt revealed the inner nature of his soul, which was grounded in the Word of God and the commitment of his heart to the ways of the Lord. Now that soul has returned to its source. 
He is as brilliant a man <coughs> as God ever created. Last Sunday we sang a hymn at our church in South Carolina entitled morning, When Morning Gilds the Skies. Coming just five days after Dad's passing, the third verse seemed like a message from God. It goes like this. Does sadness fill my mind? A solace there I find. <coughs> May Jesus Christ be praised. Or fades my earthly bliss? My comfort still is this. May Jesus Christ be praised. The fourth verse reminded me of what Dad is now doing. And it calls on us to join him. It says this. In heaven's eternal bliss, the loveliest strain is this. May Jesus Christ be praised. That earth and sea and sky from depth to height reply. May Jesus Christ be praised. The sixth verse challenges us further to praise our God even now. As long as we still have the breath of life in us. Be this while life is mine, my canticle divine, may Jesus Christ be praised. Sing this eternal song through all the ages long, may Jesus Christ be praised. Dad died on New Year's Day, 2014, and for him, that was eternity's first day. The great 19th century preacher Charles H. Spurgeon wrote a marvelous daily devotional book called Morning and Evening, which has impacted my life in a great way. I'd like to share his morning meditation of January 1 because it seems so precious and so fitting for the purpose for which we are gathered here today. It's based on Joshua 5.12. They did eat the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Israel's weary wanderings were all over and the promised rest was attained. No more moving tents, fiery serpents, fierce Amalekites, <coughs> howling wilderness. They came to the land which flowed with milk and honey, and they ate the old corn of the land. Perhaps this year, dear reader, dear Christian reader, this may be thy case or mine, as it was dad's. Joyful is the prospect, and if faith be an act of exercise, it will yield unalloyed delight. To be with Jesus and the rest which remaineth for the people of God is a cheering hope indeed. And to expect this glory so soon is a double bliss. Unbelief shudders at the Jordan which still rolls between us and the goodly land. But let us rest assured that we have already experienced more ills than death and its worst can cause us. Let us banish every fearful thought and rejoice with exceeding great joy in the prospect that this year we may begin to be with the Lord forever. Part of the host will this year tarry on earth to do service for our Lord. If this should fall to our lot, there is no reason why the New Year's text should not still be true. We who have believed do enter into rest. The Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance. He gives us glory begun below. In heaven they are secure. And so we are preserved in Christ Jesus. There they triumph over their enemies. And we have victories too. Celestial spirits enjoy communion with their Lord. And this is not denied to us. They rest in his love. And we have perfect peace in him. They hymn his praise. And it is our privilege to bless him too. We will this year gather celestial fruits on earthly ground, where faith and hope have made the desert like the garden of the Lord. Man did eat angels' food of old, and why not now? Oh, for grace to feed on Jesus, and so to eat the fruit of the land of Canaan this year.
Mother that passed away worked with us for 29 years. Some of those years, a number of them on call. She got older, but she loved to take care of older people, and um, she also had a good time taking care of Harry while she could. And after she was gone, uh, the last four years, almost four years with us, I, of course, have good memories of Harry. Um, I served in the military in the Vietnam conflict, and Harry served in World War II. And that service in Panama was not without its uh, trying times as well. I believe he said that he contracted malaria five times while he was stationed in those years in Panama. That doesn't do much good for your body before you get back and get married and start a family. And <clears throat> he'd already had some difficulty physically before that aneurysm in 73. And of course that built up even more in these closing years. And, uh, but he left his mark wherever he went. For these last years he left his mark at Elon. He was kind to residents who sat at his table for meals, wanted to make sure their families knew whether they ate or not. Uh, he always welcomed new residents, was one of those welcoming faces and voices and uh, smiles, a wonderful smile. And uh, whether it was uh, at resident council or in the social hour, he'd always be outgoing to a new person and uh, kind of help them know what he looks like and that you could uh, live there. He loved outings and activities. To get out of the building, of course, is everybody's hope when they're at Elon. And uh, he really enjoyed that very much. And even if the outing didn't go like you thought it was supposed to, like you're going out to see Christmas lights, but there aren't as many lights out as usual, he would still be very positive. He was the first one to choir practice. Uh, and I think he liked that about being at Elam, is that he could still be in a choir and uh, sing a little bit and encourage others when they came. And his favorite song to ask for when we'd ask for favorites, and Kathy White was the one that remembered this, was he'd always ask for number 55 in our big print songbook that we have. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life. And if you know... Uh, Harry, he had a quiet time with God every day. He was in his Bible every day. It's not just a, a decoration up here. It is now with a wreath around it, but uh, it was his lifeblood spiritually. And, of course, that uh, makes him dear to my heart. Uh, they're beautiful words. And like Gary said, that's where he could learn how to pray. And pray eloquently. Because if you pray the scriptures, uh, they are deep. Deep calls to deep, like Christina read. And it uh, doesn't matter how many years of school you had, if you'd learn how to read and then you read your Bible, you're going to get... intelligence that's beyond us. It's supernatural. Words. And I hear it imbibed deeply in that. Faithful at our chapel services. I especially like when we'd get together for our monthly men's Bible study where he was an active participant. He brought his own Bible and often our others can't do some of that. But 
Here he had his Bible with him all the time. His demeanor, likable. Contagious laugh. Sense of humor. Uh, I could ask if the family, I, I said I'd say this today if nobody else did. How are you feeling, Harry? With your fingers. <laughs> with your fingers. Now he told us that he learned it from his dad. You could give these retorts. How did you sleep, Harry? With my eyes shut. <laughs> so, uh, and that never left him. Even in these last days, I saw him uh, on Monday and Tuesday before the Wednesday that he died. His patience and perseverance uh, was admirable, given what he was going through. I mean, he had times he had unresponsive spells within six months after he came to us. Uh, some seizure troubles, because when your brain's been that uh, bothered. Um, he was to the ER just the last week of his life again, being checked over. But uh, God had given him grace in the face of adversity to handle it. Great perseverance, endurance. God's love, you know, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And here it endured a lot. Um, maybe the family knows this, but anybody at Elam knows that it's not easy to drive a wheelchair. But here he could drive a Broda chair, which is these big high back chairs, like you can't believe. He could whip that baby in by a table and back out and around. Um, he must have been good with driving tractors, and I'm sure he's good driving for the DAC. Because <laughs> um, boy, did he drive that chair. And of course, his love for his family. Uh, even just recently after his amputation, uh, he was so proud of the grandchildren at all, drew and drawn pictures of them with the part of the leg gone. And uh, he was just very proud to show those, to show them off to other people. Uh, here's me, you know, my uh, grandchild's conception of me. And uh, how he loved his family. And. Uh, I do pay tribute to his wonderful wife, Chris. Uh, already did for all the years she gave to us. But uh, what a blessing that they were as a couple. And it's been said, his reverence for the Word of God, for prayer, and for God Himself. When you'd uh, end your prayer with Amen, what would Harry say? So let it be. So some some pastor down here must have preached on the meaning of Amen, the Hebrew word. Um, and he had picked it up, and uh, I, I think every time he prayed with him, he would end, uh, as I'd say Amen, he'd say, So let it be. So be it. Because uh, he believed in prayer. And the, one of the first times I talked to him, he said, knowing the Lord, that's the best. Knowing the Lord, there's nothing like it to know Jesus Christ as your own Lord and Savior. And uh, he never wavered on that. God had helped him through all of his life and all of its ups and downs. And so we pay tribute to Harry today. Whatever gain I had, the Apostle said, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. I hope that's your desire today too and your understanding of your faith. That is the surpassing worth. That is the great worth of knowing Christ Jesus 
My Lord, for his sake I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Here he knew he was a sinner and you said it so well, Sandy, in that song. But it's that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him, that I may know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Oh, how he knows that power right now more than he ever did in this life. It isn't that he was perfect, but that God was perfecting him sanctifying him throughout his life and now he's been glorified in God's presence. And that's a wonderful thing to remember. It says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and also the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection of the dead. So we pay tribute to Harry today. Let us pray. O oh God, we pray with your word in mind. We pray like Harry. With the depth of these scriptures, you are our refuge and strength a very present help in this trouble, in this sorrow, in saying goodbye to a brother in Christ, to a dearly loved father and grandfather and great-grandfather. To a dearly loved member of the congregation here in these. So we want to say thank you for his life today. May the peace of Christ be ours and may we be thankful. Thankful for his service to our country. Thankful for his childhood home and his love of the land. Thankful for his love of the family he grew up in, and then the love that he had for his Chris. And the uh, example that is to those of us that are married or contemplating his love for his children, and the lengths he would go to uh, show that love and entertain the grandchildren. We give you thanks. We are grateful. And it's that love that causes our pain, our sorrow, at the separation um, that we feel today. But we have a hope. And so we sorrow as not as those that have no hope. We believe that you will come again and there will be a reunion between the church triumphant in heaven and the church militant here on earth. That we'd have a sweet communion. And we uh, acknowledge that our desire is that uh, we might all be reunited at a great marriage feast. Supper of the Lamb. And so we ask that you would comfort Sandy and her family and Carlinda, her family, Rhonda and Sherry, and families. Oh God, grant them release in their sorrow today. And we thank you for that too. We do count. You are a great creator who made Harry 
and sustained him in this life. And we count you as a great redeemer who redeemed him and brought him back from the slave block of sin and granted to him everlasting life in Jesus Christ. We pray that uh, you might be glorified even in this and that we might bless you today. Amen.
then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. When Pastor Tom and I were discussing some of the details of today's service for Harry and his family, I mentioned to Tom that I would be using Psalm 91, a favorite of Harry's, requested, after all, by Harry himself. Tom went on to inform me that Psalm 91 is sometimes referred to as the soldier's psalm. It's not hard to see why. The psalmist makes reference to things like the terror of the night, the arrows that fly by day, the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, <clears throat> talks of the thousands that will fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand. These are all images to which soldiers on a battlefield can all too closely relate. Many of us, including Harry, I'm sure, have witnessed things that we wish we wouldn't. We've done things we wish we hadn't. We've hoped for circumstances that were different than they are. Many of us have been hurt by the arrows of evil in this life. Even the strongest of believers has felt as though their circumstances were like they were being stalked by a pestilence in the darkness. Harry Morlock was a big, strong man. He could throw bales, so I'm told, with the best of them. When he got down on all fours to give horsey rides to the kids and grandkids, that was one big horsey. I also learned that those long arms of his wielded a pretty mean tennis racket for the purpose of eradicating bats. His physical presence loomed large in the room. Indeed, even when I met him for the first time in his room at the Elam home, he seemed somehow almost too big for the space. Even in his wheelchair, he was intimidating. Harry had a personality that matched his frame. Big and strong, gregarious. Always wanting to be at the next social event laughing at his own jokes before he was any, any, even finished with them, <laughs> tapping his empty coffee cup on the table as his nonverbal cue that somebody ought to fill it. That was just Harry. Whether because of his physical size or his personality, one always seemed to know when Harry Morlock was in the room. Even so, one can't avoid all the dangers of life. Things happen. <clears throat> the challenges of Psalm 91 that come toward us are impossible to hide from. In fact, many years ago, an aneurysm nearly killed him, as we've heard, and eventually forced him to give up working at the farm he loved so dearly. Tractor rides were replaced with lawnmower rides. It was a difficult time. That's why I have a feeling Psalm 42 was a favorite of Harry's. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me, says the psalmist. Those words are saying for Harry what he couldn't say for himself. He, like all of us, could not avoid getting hurt. So he did what Christians do. <coughs> he put his hope in his Savior and his God. 
I asked the family to provide some memories of their father and grandfather. Great grandfather. There were several fishing stories. Grandpa knew how to catch and clean fish. Remembrances of so much time spent playing games and doing puzzles. But more than a few, and it was mentioned here by Gary just a few moments ago, talked about his long, deep, eloquent prayers. Though I never heard him do it, Harry had an ability to pray. One granddaughter said his, word, his prayers were very heartfelt, like he and God were the only ones in the room. One of his daughters in an email wrote this. When I was a little girl, Dad would begin every evening prayer with these words. Lord, to whom shall we go but to thee alone? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Thou art the source from whom all blessings flow. These words, said Harry's daughter, were truth to me from childhood because I heard them daily and I will never forget them. This big man with the big personality to match, knew deep down the powerful truth of Psalm 91 that God was his refuge and his fortress in whom he trusted. He knew and believed and trusted in God to protect and shelter him from evil. Even when that evil sometimes self inflicted he knew that God protected and watched over him. Lord, to whom shall we go but to thee alone? <coughs> when I would visit Harry in his room, he would often say something like, God is with me. I know he is. I can feel him here with me. He'd say it in a kind of a high-pitched voice that only Harry could say it. It was his way of acknowledging the reality of Psalm 91, the reality that God Most High was his dwelling. Harry knew where his ultimate hope rested. Life's not always easy. Living this side of heaven is difficult and challenging, and Harry knew this as well as anyone. Things happen to us we wish hadn't. We do things we wish we could take back. We see things we wish we didn't. And when we do, we can, like Harry, say, to whom shall we go but to thee alone? In starting his prayers with these words, Harry really wasn't asking a question. He knew the answer. Starting his prayers with these words was his way of acknowledging with the psalmist the words of God at the end of Psalm 91, those last few verses. And I'll insert Harry's name here. Because Harry loves me, says the Lord. I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. Harry will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Those are powerful words. God showed Harry his salvation. God has shown all of us his salvation in Jesus Christ. No matter what life throws our way, we have a God who, as the psalmist says, has covered us with his feathers. We all know we are perfect. We have a God who has covered us with his feathers, a God under whose wings we find refuge. Even the big shadow of Harry Morlog rested in the all-encompassing shadow of the Almighty God. As family and friends, we come today on this day of mourning and remembering, sometimes with laughter and sometimes with, with tears. And 
and we rest in the shadow of the Almighty. <coughs> the one to whom we come because we know we've got no place else to go. The one who is our salvation. The one who alone has the words of eternal life. The one who answers us when we call. The one who protects and rescues us in Jesus Christ. Harry, like all of us who claim Jesus as Lord and Savior, dwell in the shelter of the Most High and rest in the shadow of the Almighty. One of Harry's granddaughters <coughs> tells about remembering her grandpa's hands. Those big, strong, rough hands that would gently move the small little checker pieces around the game board as they played. Him helping her decide which pieces to move so she would beat him. Hands that seemed too big and strong to hold hers, and yet they did, ever so gently. Hands that were to her as a little girl a paradox, too big and rough and strong, to be so gentle, gentle and tender and loving. God, like those hands of Herod's, is a paradox. The same God who so mightily shields us from the dangers and toils and snares of this life, the arrows, the pestilence, the darkness, the battlefields of life, is the same God who gently covers us with his feathers. The same God who so powerfully saves us from the fowler's snare, perhaps a euphemism for death itself, is the same God who sent his son. A son whose hands were nailed to a cross in passive and loving obedience, so that he might show us his salvation and grant us those words of eternal life that Harry began so many prayers with. That is the God in whom we take refuge today and every day. The God in whom we trust. I can't say it any better than Psalm 91 does. If you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands, says the psalm so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. For just as we sung earlier, it is not what our hands have done, but the strong and loving hands of Jesus Christ that have become our salvation. One more story about Harry's hands before we end. I was told the story about fishing on Serpent Lake with the girls. A stringer full of fish. I'm going to put one more on. And those big, strong hands let that stringer go. And all the fish down to the bottom. A memory that was laughed over in my office. But God. Those big, strong hands of God will never let us go. He is holding you in them. God is with us, just like Harry said he was with him in that nursing home room. Rest then today in God's big, strong, gentle, loving hands. Just like Harry. Would you pray with me, please? <coughs> Lord, to whom shall we go but to Thee alone? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Thou art the source from whom all blessings flow. Hold us in Your powerful and loving hands, the same hands with which You have received Harry, cover us with the same feathers with which you have covered him. May we, by the power of your Holy Spirit, rest in your shadow, even as you protect us from the troubles 
of this life. Rest upon us by your Spirit. Surround us with your presence as you have and will. Amen. Today, as every day, our own hands, big or small, rough or smooth, gentle or powerful, cling to the cross of Jesus Christ, the place where the crowns of our salvation are found. Please rise to sing the old rugged cross.
outside the doors for the military honors, after which they will proceed to the cemetery for the burial and committal service. If you'd like to join the family, please feel free to do so. I think the terrain might be a little treacherous today, so know that if you do decide to, to venture out. Otherwise, you are welcome to stay for lunch upstairs. The family asks that you please begin eating right away. Go with God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen.
impediment to the American Legion and the VFW. I'd like to present you this flag in remembrance of the Park Dynamite Hill. You have our support. Sergeant at Arms, Smith the Departed. Detail, up here in Jersey. Report, Arms. Prepare to fire. Ready, aim, fire. Aim, fire. Aim, fire. Report, Arms. Present, Horn.